So, know what dog you have and forget the dog I want. Um, so the, the reason why I, I have this uh, title is because when people um, acquire a dog or they bring a dog into their lives, um, they already have um, a fantasy of what they're going to do with the dog. They, they get this puppy and they, they buy the puppy based upon looks, based upon the color, based upon how cute he is, based upon um, um, you know, the attractiveness because it was the puppy that run to them in the litter when they, um, when they visited the breeder and then they have this dream. This, they have already visualized what they're going to do with the dog in the future. They're going to camp, they're going to go hiking, they want a, um, they want a best companion dog, they want to go running with the dog, they want to go mountain biking with the dog, and then uh, when they're sound asleep, they want the dog to also protect him a little bit, they want him to bark at strangers or at least uh, guard the yard, and then hopefully when somebody breaks into their car, the dog will protect them as well. And the dog needs to be nice to all people and, and kids and the, the dog needs to be neutral to uh, all other animals and they have a cat um, that's already 16 years old where the new dog needs to be best friends with and so they have this entire laundry list of ideas um, before they even get the dog and then they pick the dog based upon uh, phenotype not genetic and phenotype is basically how the dog looks. They said, oh my God, this dog is stinking cute and he came running to me at the breeder with his wagging tail or um, I picked him out of the shelter because I stood into, in front of his little cage and he looked uh, to me with these very sad eyes and then I was, I melted and so I got him. And um, so often the dog that they have is absolutely not the dog that they wanted. And um, I'm going to talk about this, why that is, and I'm also going to talk about why, you choose, why would you or should you forget the dog that you want. I want you to throw all your dreams out of the water. I want you to forget everything that you ever wanted to do with the dog in order to be able to get there. Yeah, because um, one of the biggest reasons why people fail with their dogs or why people have problems with their dog is disappointment yeah and disappointment um, in what they're doing with their dog because they they have the dog and he's actually not so good in agility and he turned out to be a little bit more anxious and he's actually not a great runner and then when he's a year old he had a little bit of hip dysplasia and slowly but surely the whole cart house of dreams start falling apart and the reason again is because when we pick out the dog, um, have we really done our research in what dog, um, is, what dog do we need to pick in order to fulfill this question? Yeah, um, we pick the dog probably because of emotion and of cuteness rather than uh, utility and uh, matching our lifestyle. So. One of the first things that, um, that is important is when we, when we look at our dogs, when we uh, have the dog in front of us, is to really uh, start understanding where is the dog coming from, yeah? So I have my dog and what is it, yeah? What is, um, where does he come from? And where does he come from? is not just the breeder. Yeah, it goes a lot further. What is his antecedents? Um, in history, what country is he originated from? What part of the world? And all that stuff. Yeah, the, the German Shepherd um, comes from a different part of the world than the Alaskan Malamutes, than the uh, Pekingese, than the, um, you know, Australian cattle dog, etc., etc. So where our dog comes from is not just the breeder, but is the, you know, the part of the world. And that is going to um, 
tell us a lot, and I'll, I'll explain that uh, later. And then the other uh, thing that we need to look, uh, look at is um, what was the dog bred for? What was the utility of the dog? Yeah? I always laugh with people that buy Pomeranian because it's cute and you actually bought a giant um, spitz breed in a very tiny body. And that Pomeranian was used to attack and protect and be very vicious. And then people buy it because it's cute and now they have this little barker and little biter that does his job uh, um, to any strange things he sees. And then the utility of this dog was, you know, exactly that, being a, a little pocket protector. You know, the same thing with little terriers with chihuahuas, you know. Uh, oh my God, my chihuahua digs up my yard. Well, that's what he was bred for, you know, to have rodent control. So, you know, when you have a house in, uh, in the country and you have molehills, the, mo the, the likelihood that's going to happen if you have a chihuahua is that he's going to dig up the entire yard and molehills and kill every mole that he sees, and probably the cat and probably the rat and probably the mouse and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And then um, when people say, oh shit, my dog uh, digs, I want him to stop digging. And I say, well, get rid of the chihuahua then, because chihuahuas are diggers, yeah? So we need to look at the utility. And then um, we also need to look at what the, um, the antecedents of his social um, living environment is. What was the dogs um, exposed to for decades or for multiple uh, generations? always tell me I'm an asshole and the reason why I'm an asshole is because I come from a family of assholes. You know, my father was an asshole, my grandfather was an asshole, his, his father was an asshole and his grandfather was an asshole. And because I'm su I was surrounded by, you know, assholes for a hundred and, or, you know, a hundred and more years, you know, I, I have the antecedent of being an asshole. So with dogs, I make this, this joke, but with dogs, that's the same thing. So if we, for instance, go to a breeder, and um, that breeder, the environment is very stressed. Right? We see breeders that have a small, small property. They have 30 to 40 dogs. It's always barking, always chaos. And, and generation after generation, these, these dogs have grown up in a social environment that, that they are stressed in. So the likelihood that, that that dog is going to be stressed is pretty, pretty high. Yeah? Um, so the the social environment, the antecedents of the social environment for, for many generations will influence what dog I eventually going to end up uh, with. Yeah. Then um, the, the other thing um, um, that we have um, is um, based upon the job, based upon our genetic ancestry. Is it, a, is it a new breed? And by new breed, I, I talk about designer dogs. Is it an old breed? An ancient, like old breed, ancient breed? So how, how much percentage of residual wolf DNA is in that dog? Um, and, you know, um, in, in the working lines, you know, what is the ancestry to the original breed? And I do a, a genetic class on the German Shepherd, and I'm going to take the German Shepherd as an uh, example. Um, this is one of the most important aspects in what dog do I have? Because it's not, because it says German Shepherd that it's the same dog as my dog. Or I have, um, here I have five, six German Shepherds on the property and then um, three are completely different than the other and then there's a, a little bit of a mix and the reason why is because of the genetic ancestry 
So when the dogs, when the um, Max von Stefanich, um, who originally bred the German Shepherds, he had utility in mind. He said the German Shepherds will be a dog that is um, extremely um, uh, loyal, um, extremely confident, extremely healthy. Um, it's a dog that um, can do a multiple uh, multiple tasks, he can protect, he can obey, he can use his nose um, and he's very sound in any environment that I uh, put him in. Yeah? And if you look at where the German Shepherd uh, originally came from, from uh, Germany, one of the things that we need to realize, and let me turn my board uh, here, is the German Shepherd is a pre-World War I with the goal to fight in World War I, yeah, to fight in the war, yeah. uh, 1894. Yeah, the Germans were already planning the, in, the invasion and the takeover of the world slowly but surely and then in um, you know, 1912 uh, they, they went uh, there. So the dog um, bred in East uh, Germany, um, and East Germany is a m moderate cold climate. Uh, climate surrounded by woods, mountains, snow. Um, pretty large, um, you know, uh, areas, so um, open, large open areas. Um, and the, the job for the dog was going to be the, the soldier's, soldier's buddy. Um, that needed to be obedient, that needed to be confident, that was able to work by himself, that was able to protect, that was able to use his nose, um, that was able to so use his nose, track people, find objects and objects that were like knives and firearms and all that stuff, find objects. And then, um, you know, protect a soldier and able to apprehend. And that's everything there. And he needed to, and that in a very healthy body, very compact body. Eh? Um, so, having said that, that was the original plan. So if the, the German Shepherd, he had about, you know, two and a half, three percent of wolf, uh, wolf DNA in him. Um, and when the, the German Shepherd was first uh, created, uh, this was kind of the dog that we had. And um, there's, there's videos uh, on our Facebook group that um, that is uh, from the Progrini Strasse kennels. It's unfortunately, it's narrated in Czech, but just watch it and, and uh, listen to the music and listen to, but watch the images and then you'll have a, look, have a good picture on um, you know, what a German Shepherd looked like. And it doesn't look like anything that the German Shepherd looks like today. Uh, today we have this miss, is deformed, um, ugly, little, you know, giant dog with frog legs um, that is scared of uh, everything in his life. And the reason why that happened is within, after the, the German Shepherd was originally bred, um, different breeders start breeding for different stuff, you know. Um, so we have the original German Shepherd and slowly but surely we started to have different lines 
And today we have 17 different genotypes of the German Shepherd. 17 different genotypes. That means that your German Shepherd might not be genetically the same as my German Shepherd. And that is, that is a problem. And the reason why that happened is because of bad breeding, yeah? People don't know what they're doing. And the, the bad breeding is like um, cute dog number A was bred with cute dog number B. Cute, non, cute dog number A is completely mentally insane and cute dog number B is mentally sane but physically completely uh, crooked. His body is literally shot. So now, out of that, I have 50% of the dogs that have a, have a bad body and are completely mentally insane. And then those started becoming, you know, bred with each other because they got cuter and cuter and cuter. And so eventually, and I blame the United States, uh, United States breeders for this, is everything was looks. Everything needs to be bigger and cuter. And um, I blame the organizations like AKC, like uh, UKC, um, like all the show uh, organizations for that uh, breeding. And then money was, uh, was a huge uh, thing. Um, because they wanted to, the red a little bit redder and the black a little bit br uh, blacker, but um, eventually breeders did not care about the original um, goal that the dog was bred for. The original utility was kind of left behind. And the reason why is, you know, um, in, in the 1970s, we, we didn't have the need for these dogs that were walking with a soldier and all that stuff. Um, so, so, you know, the, the utility was left behind. The original sport of Schutzhund that was developed by von Stefanich in 1904 as a breed suitability test, yeah, um, was turned into this sport. And I was a former Schutzhund competitor and I loved the sport. Um, but then slowly but surely, um, because of um, rules that were changed in the sport, like in the old days we would beat the dog with a stick, um, we would, you know, the dogs would um, um, bite on this hard jute suit, they, they would, you know, jump over real obstacles instead of obstacles where, you know, the top bar would, would fall off in, in order to protect the dog's leg, etc., etc. And so we bred softer and softer dogs because of the, 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 the requirements, the, the breed standards were lowered and lowered and lowered and lowered. And um, that's why I left the sport, because we were breeding pussy dogs instead of, you know, um, original, hard, confident, stable German Shepherds. And so I, with, with many breeds, we have seen stuff like that through, you know, domestication in breeding. And every time we breed, we are, the, the evolution of domestication um, you know, goes, goes, goes forward. Uh, we, we are still in that process of domestication and if we if I look r right now where the dogs are socially exposed to so we, we dropped standards and then um, if we see how we you know we pamper the dogs we baby the dogs we buy freaking fragrance for them uh, we have uh, nice cute pink purses that we can carry the dog on uh, Hollywood Boulevard um, then all that stuff has has let to uh, weakening a lot of breeds and introducing a lot of, um, you know, uh, defects, genetic defects, um, mental defects and physical defects. And so right now, if we are looking at the breed, and uh, again, I'm going to take the German Shepherd, um, getting a German Shepherd from a, a, a breeder is not a easy task. It is not because you say, hey, I want a German Shepherd, and you go to a particular German Shepherd breeder that you're actually going to end up with a German Shepherd. Yeah? It doesn't mean that because it looks like a German Shepherd that you have a German Shepherd, because that is, that is not true. 
Eh? And the reason why is because um, with, with those 17 different genotypes, um, you might be far away what the original standard of the German Shepherd is. And so knowing that, knowing what dog you have, if, if, if we buy a German Shepherd, for instance, and we read about the German Shepherd, yeah, this noble dog with a lot of courage, with the uh, natural uh, uh, capabilities of protecting the dog, um, great temperament, great nose, great nerve strength, and then we bought a German Shepherd and we end up with a basket case that, that shits his pants because he saw a fly flying by. Well, you probably won't, uh, don't have a German Shepherd. You have something that looks like a German Shepherd. Yeah? Um, and that is what we need to start understanding. Yeah, so what, what we as humans or as dog owners need to do is do a little bit of research in, you know, where does my dog come from? And then what was the original idea of the dog and how far is my dog away from that original picture? And then, um, and then letting go of your original picture and, and accepting what dog you have. And that is the biggest and, and hardest thing to do. Um, and the other problem that a lot of people have is, um, I, and I see that here at, at my facility all the time, um, I train a lot of German Shepherds and people come with their German Shepherd and then I have a German Shepherd and, and then I have multiple German Shepherds and then I'm on the field doing stuff with my German Shepherd, I do German Shepherds things and then people compare their dog with mine. It's like me driving in a Ford F, uh, the, 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 the Mustang, and I go to um, the farmer, and I see him having a big Ford tractor, and I'm going to start comparing my Ford Mustang to his tractor, and then I'm disappointed I can't plow the field with my Mustang. Yeah? Or I drive my big Ford tractor, and I'm going to the 90 Speedway, and I see the Ford Mustangs in the ovals, and I said, oh my god, they're going so fast, and then I'm disappointed my tractor doesn't go that fast. Yeah? And so people do that all the time. People come here with a particular dog that looks like a German Shepherd or that looks like a Lab and then um, that looks like a Malinois. Um, and then they, they expect to do Malinois things or German Shepherd things or Labrador things and they're utterly disappointed because they brought a tractor to a racetrack or they brought a racetrack to a, to a farm. And it's not realizing um, you know, that you have a tractor um, and that you shouldn't uh, put that tractor into a racetrack and that you shouldn't put the racetrack, a uh, race car into um, a, a farm field. That is the most difficult thing for people to do because they don't realize what dog they actually have. So, when, when we go back to uh, the question, where does my dog come from? One of the questions that I need to answer um, is what is Germany? You know, and the Czech Republic. This is where, where I'm, um, where the German Shepherd comes from. Yeah, east uh, at the DDR and um, the Czech uh, Republic. Is what? What is that for environment? Cold. Mountain, yeah. It's hazardous. Wildlife. Yeah, wildlife, etc., etc. One of the things that I, I have people say, oh my God, I have a German Shepherd, but I hate how much he sheds. It's like, where does he come from? Cold, mountainous, hazardous things with wildlife. So what, what's going to happen when the dog runs into the woods? Are you going to run in brush, yeah? He's going to encounter uh, wildlife. So what do you think is going to happen with his skin and his fur? Should be probably a little bit thicker than normal. Yeah, so, the, so my German Shepherds, um, little guy, that's, that's a triple coat. That, I have three Roombas. I need three Roombas. I've got one, but I need three Roombas. Yeah? Why? Because he has triple coats. He sheds three times as much. 
And then if I compare the climate from where he genetically comes from to where he is now, what's the difference? It's always wet and warm here. It's never cold. Well, it's cold, but not German Shepherd cold. It's not minus 20 or minus, um, you know, minus 20 degrees. And then so people complain about their, uh, their coat. And so what do they do? They bring the doggy to the groomer. And so then what they do is they destroy the coat, etc., etc. So then what was the German Shepherd bred for? Yeah, he's a soldier. He's going to do soldiery things. Like what? Bark, like bark, yeah? Bark, protect. Protect. What else? Bite. Bite. He loves to bite. Sniff, yeah. Sniff stuff. And then, you know, people... People have a German Shepherd, and then the German Shepherd turns eight months old, and he starts barking at everything. They say, like, oh, my God, that's fucking annoying. Well, you just caught German Shepherd. He barks. That's what he does. It's not his fault that it's, like, wired in his thing that he needs to bark at everything in his life. Yeah. And then, oh, yeah, and then whenever he sees a stranger, um, then he starts growling at him a little bit. He's got this, like, he's got whale eyes. It gives him a stinky eye, and he goes, Zzz. I don't like that. You got German Shepherds. Of course they're going to do that. Yeah. And then um, my German Shepherd, when I'm in the woods, he sniffs fucking everything. Like literally everything. Every tree, every pea, everything, everything. He's obsessed by, by squirrels, by rabbits, by stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, look where he comes from. You know what, he, what they originally ate? ate? His meat. And then the border patrol dogs, you know what they were doing? They were border patrol dogs. Here's a moat, there's a barbed wire and a fence, and then if you want to eat, go grab what's in the woods, come back and do your job. Very solistic dogs. Oh, my, my, my East German border patrol dog has a will of his own. So he's like, all that stuff about engagement, it's so hard. Yeah, yeah, what he was bred to do for. It's like, do his job by himself, find food by himself. Yeah, that's, that's Bella. And then, um, and then it's, it's me on the back of the line that has a problem and said, hey, my dog, he doesn't want to pay attention to me and he's interested in every wildlife stuff and every strange thing he sees, he growls and lunges and do stuff. Yeah, look where it comes from. He's bred to do that. If you want uh, a lassie, yeah, because that's the American version of the German Shepherd, then you should have gone to Hollywood and buy a lassie. But it's not a German Shepherd. It looks like a German Shepherd, but it is not a German Shepherd. It is a version of a German Shepherd. Yeah? So when, when we go to the extreme, when we go to the American bred German Shepherd, I call it the show dogs, yeah, the show, the show dogs. What was he bred for? Looks. Looks, yes. What else is he bred for? The ego of the human. My doggy is prettier than your doggy. My doggy is taller than your doggy. My doggy can prance more beautiful than your doggy. Yeah? And so what is he not bred to do? Work. Yes, to work. He's not bred to work. What else is he not bred for? Anything. Yeah, to be healthy. He's not bred to be healthy. And why? Because we made him bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then... We like that like stance, and then we like to stance, and then we like the little slope, and we like the little slope, and now we have these dogs that, <laughs> you see the German Shepherds, we call them frog legs, they literally walk like this, yeah? We have some here in the, in the group that have a lot of show line in them, and you'll see it on the paws, yeah? Just start observing when we're working on the touch boards, which dogs that are that. Um, so yeah, so... So now you bring, you bought this dog, you have this in mind, this is what you wanted. 
you wanted your personal protection dog, you wanted a dog that were, you were going to do Schutzhund with, but you bought this. And you know why? Because it looked really, really, really good. And then you come here and your doggy can't do it, and then you know what happens with people when their doggy can't do stuff? They're disappointed. And then when you're disappointed, what's going to happen? Your dog is going to feel it. Now your dog is getting a little bit angry at you, resentment. So why are you angry at me? Because you're disappointed. And then problem behavior starts uh, happening. Yeah? So, if we look at the utility of your lab, you have a black lab, yeah? Where does your black lab come from? From black lab land? Where does your, where does the black lab come from? Like historically? Please. No idea. No idea. You see when I start throwing people under the bus? What? You see, you see when I start throwing people under the bus? Yes. So we have a dog that comes from no idea. So what was he bred for? Show. No. Okay. The original Labrador? The original black Labrador. Help with fishing. Yes. And what else? The black lab was a fisher. What else? Hunting. Well, the hunting part comes later when they moved to when they bred him in England. Yes. Good. So where does he originally come from? The black lab. Newfoundland. Yes. Labrador. Thank you. He comes from Labrador. And where is Labrador? Yes. What country is Labrador in? Canada. 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 And how, how far up is Labrador? Far north. Very fucking far north. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So now we have this guy that comes from Labrador. He's a black lab. And then one of the things that he would do is would help fish. So how, how did they do? How, you, you know a little bit about the black the lab history. So how did they fish with the black labs or with the labs? They were to pull in the nets. Yes. Yes, because they were um, uh, trawlers. Yeah. So they they pull. Fuck my dog's a puller. He always pulls on the leash. Especially the labs, they pull on leashes like more than any other dog on the planet. Why? They pull fish nets. And where do they pull fish nets? Oh my fucking God. If my lab sees water, he's like completely loses his mind. Where do fish live? In the desert or the water? In the water. Your dog likes water? Mm -hmm. Like a lot, yeah? Yeah? And then people say, my God, every time I, I, I'm close to a lake, my dog pulls me to the water like crazy. You bought a black lab. Of course he's going to do that. You see where I'm, coming, where, where I'm going? OK. What's the climate there? Cold. Very cold, yeah? Genetically cold. So it's cold, cold water. So what do black labs remember? Um, yeah, you came here in the summer, and we worked with Baloo and with um, Buddy. What would you say was the energy level of Baloo and Buddy in the summer? Very active, still active, but not like in the winter. But not like in the winter. They're, they're, they're tired. Yeah. So the thing is, their mind wants to go. Yeah, in the summer, their mind wants to go, their body, however, tires out pretty quickly. Uh, tired. So, what do you think is going to happen with a dog that his body is tired, but he is, uh, his mind is still going? Distraction. Yes. Your dog chews on shit? No, not so much when he's bored. Grab stuff. Grab stuff. Grab stuff. Collect stuff. Takes it to places. Hide it. Because then that's what happens, yeah? 
Because what, what was the other thing and the reason why I go there? What was the other thing with the labs? What did they do when the fishers lost stuff? Ah, oh, okay, there we go. They retrieve. And what does your lab like to do? Probably bring you stuff. And then what, what does the lab ask you? Oh, come on, eight, it? What is the lab asking you to do? To throw it away or to pull it somewhere? And then I have clients that come to me with, with black labs. And then they ask me, the one thing that I don't like about my dog is that he pulls like a maniac. He's obsessed by water and he brings me this stuff all the time. It drives me crazy. So what's my answer? Don't get a lab. Yeah, you, you, you see where I'm, I'm, I'm going to? So understanding that, yeah, understanding where my dog comes from um, is very important. Okay, um, we have a rat terrier chihuahua mix. His name is Tiny. Okay. I'm sorry? Give the 18th on that one. Yeah, yeah. So. So we have Taina, Tiny, which is a Chihuahua uh, plus terrier. And it's like a rat terrier, yeah, because a mini terrier. So where does the Chihuahua come from? Mexico. What city? <laughs> Chihuahua. Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So he comes from Mexico from... Chihuahua. Okay, you ever seen Chihuahua on a map? What kind of climate is it and what kind of like, it's pretty rough. Yeah. Very rough. It's dry. Kind of deserty. Got snakes there. And what else? Tarantulas. Tarantulas. Lizards. Tequila. What? Tequila? Tequila. Tequila. They got tequila. And so what was Mr. Chihuahua in Chihuahua bred to do? What was his utility? Kill the freaking lizards, kill the freaking uh, tarantulas, and kill the freaking snakes. Where do you think all these animals are hiding? In the house, small dark places, and then in in the ground, etc., etc. What do chihuahuas like to do? Bark. And what else? Dig. 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 And what else? Chase shit. Why? They hunt. Because they're bred in Chihuahua to, to do that in a rough, dry, warm climate. They're bred to find snakes, tarantula, lizards, rats, rodents, and all the other stuff. Um, in the house, in the yard, by, by themselves or with the handler accompanying them with their cute little purse? By themselves. By themselves. Yeah, so they do that solo. You know what people tell me when they have a Chihuahua? Oh my God, I can't get a relationship with this dog. This dog tries to crawl in every little hole possible, is chasing everything that has four paws and barks at it when he sees it. So what do you have? A chihuahua. <laughs> Why did you buy it? Ah, it is cute. Yeah, so I bought the dog. What I want was a cute dog. What I got was a working dog. I got a dog that loves a job. And then I have a terrier here. So where does a, where does a rat terrier come from? Are they British? Yes, they are. So it's basically a chihuahua in a wetter climate. Because what was the terrier bred to do? To keep the horse stables clean from rodents. 
and the castle cellars and all that stuff. And how did he do that? With, uh, with the princess next to him and say, hey, little uh, terrier, or, or did he do that by himself? Solo. Good. And also, what's the climate in uh, England? Wet, cold, like Washington a little bit, yeah? So, yeah, wet, cold, and then warm summers. Okay. And so what does the terrier do when he sees stuff? Barks and chases. Barks and chases. And Barks, digs, and hunts. And now... What we're going to do is we're going to make a designer dog. We're in Hollywood. We like the look from a chihuahua with a rat terrier. You know why? It's extra cute. And so now I have a dog that does what? Barks. Barks a little bit more barks frantically, chases everything frantically, and does not give a shit about you. And so what people come when they, they're here with their dogs is when they have a mix like that, what is the first thing they say? My dog barks, chases everything, and doesn't give a shit about me. Help. Well, was that the dog that you want? No, no, but I like him. Why do you like him? Oh my God, look at him. He's cute. Yeah? And so that's where... Um, what, I, what I try to demonstrate with this is what is very important is that at that particular moment, if we want to get better with the dog, if we want to solve the problems that you have, because these are not Chihuahua problems and these are not Terrier problems. All these are human problems. You have a problem with a pulling dog, you have a problem with a dog that obsesses by water, and you have a, do a, a problem with a dog that barks for a living, and that growls for a living, and that, um, you know, hunts for a living. That is the human problem, yeah? And the reason why you have a problem is you didn't buy the dog for that utility. You bought the dog for a completely different utility. You bought the dog because, A, first he was cute. You always wanted a chihuahua. Yeah? You know why? Because you saw Paris Hilton with her chihuahua in a movie uh, show, and it had it in a purse, and it was full of diamonds and glitter, and, oh, my God, this was the cutest little dog on the planet. Yeah? Um, so you wanted that, and you had no idea where it comes from. And then the job that you have for the chihuahua is to look cute with your friends at tea parties, yeah, is to walk around in Seattle and have him behave and not bark at the rats and not bark at the tarantulas and not bark at anything that moves. Um, and there you go. The unfortunate thing for the dog is that, that that is not him. What you wanted is a different dog. You didn't want a chihuahua. You didn't want a terrier. You wanted something different. And there's the door. There's a, I, I, you, would, you would have better off buy a King, King Charles Spaniel. Looks cute, is cute, walks cute, wants to be cute, loves to be dressed up. And his job was doing what? Being cute. Being cute. That dog was literally, literally bred to be with the royalty and look really, really cute. But because you didn't like the looks of the uh, King Charles Spaniel, he bought the Chihuahua. See where I'm going with this lecture? And so that is a human problem. So what happens, what happens if we if we start training our dogs with the dog that we want. So in our entire program, we, we have the dog that we want, not the dog that we have. We wanted our calm dog, we wanted our stuff. Is the biggest problem 
with that is that we forget the innate behaviors. That we are start working with the dog against what he naturally does and start punishing what he naturally does. Yeah? So we want a calm dog. Calm dog that does not dig. No digging. No digger. And I've got my chihuahua. Eh? But what I have is what? I have a prey obsessed dog that naturally digs. That's what I have. And this is what I want, but this is what I have. So what do people normally do when they see the dog doing stuff they innately do? Ah, they punish the dog, yes. So the way they control this is they're going to punish this behavior. They're going to put an aversive on this behavior when this behavior occurs. What is going to happen to the dog? The dog's going to understand why he's punished? No. Why? Because he's doing what is innate. The dog is doing what he's in innately doing. He cannot... He cannot stop thinking about chasing stuff and about digging stuff. So punishing that is going to work against you. Yeah? What do you think that's going to do with how he looks at you? Uh, is that going to be a trust building experience or you think it's going to be the opposite? It's the opposite. Yeah. So now I have a dog that naturally pulls, naturally growls at people, naturally barks at people. And then the first thing that I'm going to do is like, I'm going to start punishing it. What do you think that's going to happen to you? It's not going to trust it. Yeah? So one of the biggest things that we need to do is we need to find a way to channel this motivation in, start in, 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 in order for, um, in, rather than punishing this behavior from these dogs, we need to redirect this behavior. We need to find a way so the dogs desires, the dog's motivators, are fulfilled. Because if the dog's desires are not fulfilled, what's going to happen with that? The dog is going to be frustrated. Yeah? So if you have a dog that's bred to bite and he never bites in his life, what eventually is going to happen? He's going to be frustrated. He's going to bite stuff that he shouldn't bite. Yeah, maybe your, 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 your tables, your couches, your stuff like that, and then you start punishing that, and then what's going to happen is you're going to get more frustrated and frustrated. If you have a dog that likes to chase stuff, but you don't like it, and you're going to uh, uh, reward the dog and try to train the dog with food, and here's a little piece of food, it's not going to help you. Why? Because he's going to chase to get food. Yeah, the dog likes to chase. So what we need to do is to find a reinforcer when we train it, that when he changes certain behaviors, for instance, when he stops digging, not digging in the yard, that he's allowed to chase, to chase. So that's why sometimes I work chihuahuas and terriers on a flirt pole like a cat toy. And then their, their reward is actually you know, chasing the, the, the flirt pole and the cat toy rather than giving a piece of food because the, the guy is not motivated in that piece of food but he's really motivated in chasing something that looks like a mouse and when he's actually sit calmly in front of you and he looks at you, he's, now he's able to chase the stuff that he likes to chase, you know, this little mouse. And that is very important. And so where people get into trouble is the... When they, when they go to trainers or they train themselves, is they train the dog that they want to have, but forget the dog that they have. They forget what the dog's motivators are, what the dogs innately do, and in what climate they do it. Yeah? So if you, if you want to reward your black lab, and you would do it, and you involve water, and having something pulling out of the water and bringing it back to you and you throw it back into the water, what do you think is going to happen? The dog's going to freaking love you. Because he said, oh my God, this reinforces is close to what I, what, I, what I want. So if we can then redirect the dog and say, hey, if you sit still in front of me, then eventually you can do that.
that's better training. That takes a little bit of time, but that's better training than punishing the dog for doing his normal things, yeah? And, and that is, I think, one of the biggest key elements that I would like you to, to get out of, uh, of that today, is that um, when, when you interact with a dog and your dog does something that he does innately really good and really intense, that it's very hard for him not to think about it and that it's very hard for him to stop doing these innate things because it's genetically there, yeah? And punishing that will, will often not work, will work against you. So um, I'm gonna see if there's any questions in my online group here. I'm looking at the yell. I'm gonna give this about a minute uh, right now, and then... I, I don't have my reading glasses, so if you can, um, I could go get my reading glasses, but. Love your knowledge and compliments. Knowledge and teaching style, uh, human beatability. What is it? Which one? Oh yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah Billy said, but, uh, but my dog ju looks just like your dog. That is, that is true. So thank you guys for all the uh, comments um, and, the, and the likes. Um, but uh, please uh, put any questions in the comments below and then as soon as they come in, um, Al will collect them and then eventually uh, maybe after the session we can, we can do all the, um, um, you know, I'll answer all of, uh, all of the questions. So, So if we, if we understand the innate behaviors, if we understand um, where my dog comes from, so I know where it comes from, I know his antecedents, and I know his genotype. And then all of the, I would say, malfunctions that he comes from. Then I kind of start realizing what do I have. And this is where we need to work with. And um, when, we, when, we, when I look here at my, my group, uh, in the world of dog training, I am I am more known for the work that I do with um, other, other clubs and trainers call it the shit dogs, you know, and the, the throwaway dogs and the no good dogs and um, the dogs that, you know, that shouldn't be, be sold. Eh? Um, um, they call me Dr. Canis Familiaris instead of, you know, my, my sports, uh, my sport dog. So my reputation has changed from, you know, putting people onto the world championships to now uh, working with people with, uh, with their shit dogs. And um, the reason why I have this reputation um, is when people buy the German Shepherd with the goal to go to a a Schutzen club or a I IGP club or IPO club, or they buy a Malinois, and we've seen many, many, many Malinois here that looks like a Malinois, but it's got nothing to do with a Malinois, um, that have the dream to do ring sports or um, they want police work, and they're so disappointed because their doggy can't do it. It's either out of control, too drivey, um, it's anxious, it's, um, it's, it's dog reactive, people reactive, you know, environmental, um, no, no problems. That when they bring the dogs, that if we realize what we have, the first thing that I tell these people is to let go of their goals. Forget your sport, forget your personal protection, forget um, your agility, forget walking on a leash, I sometimes tell people. 
just forget it and because the reason why people want to walk a dog on a leash around the block is because for their uh, uh, sanity because they believe that walking on a leash is actually an, uh, a necessary thing for uh, for dogs to do which is the uh, utmost nonsense that i've ever heard because i've never heard a dog asking me say hey muddy put this like weird thing on my collar and then yank it a couple of times and then we'll have a lot of fun like uh, walking walking in the city from shit that i'm fucking fucking scared of you know it's dogs don't like it yeah. um so so when we understand that our dog is anxious our dog is drivey our dog does have maybe uh you know, a genetic health uh, defect, um, and that my dog, you know, come from lines that have shown these traits, then I can work with that. But if I'm stuck in, in my IGP or IPG dream, in my sport uh, dream, then I'm not going to do the dog any justice. Yeah? So the, the first thing that we as humans need to learn is to learn to observe our dogs and study the dog that you have. And often, the, and the reason why I say this is to learn to look at your dog, not my dog and not um, her dog and not May's dog and not Ken's dog, um, is to, to just objectively look at your dog what it is what i have and then then do a little bit of research where does he come from what kennel does he uh, come from what shelter did i rescue him from what type of dogs do they normally we have there what's kind of the living environment etc etc and what kind of weird behaviors for me weird behaviors does he um does he exhibit when i'm in my yard, in my, in my garage, with me, in, 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 in the city, etc., etc., and then start building this picture of the dog that you have. And, and then do not compare your black lab with Blue or with her chocolate lab, because they're very different. This is your back, black lab. And then if you see, and it's like, oh my God, Look at that black lab, he's like... That's all he does. And yours like all over the place. Yeah? It's one of the things that could be different is the genotype. Yeah? Because how many, how many genotypes are in labs? Seven. You got show lines. You got lines that are bred for hunting. You got lines that now are bred for doing what? being fat and lay in a hospital and if people crowd them and use them as a therapy dog. There's, there's, there's generations of fat labs right there that that's what they do, you know, lay, get fed the entire day, drool, okay, good human, and let them be petted. If you would compare, if I would have a dog like that and compare him with Goose, I would be utterly disappointment, but disappointment in the energy level between the two dogs and what he, he does. And, but if, if you wanted that, that calm dog, that you, you had your, your life goal, you wanted to help children and you wanted to have a therapy dog, yeah? Bandit, That's, that was their goal, yeah? They have Bandit, but their life dream was being a therapy dog. You would be utterly disappointed. And then the problem, what people, when, when you have that dream, is it's the dog's fault. Because you can't squeeze the, the, the square into the round hole. But it's the square's fault because it doesn't fit in the round hole. And you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And eventually what's going to happen, that square is going to break. It's going to fit through the, the, the hole, but it's going to come out pretty fucked up. And that's what people do with their dogs. Rather than taking a step back and say, you know what, um, probably Bandit is not suitable to be a therapy dog. Yeah, and I, you know, I use Bandit because he's such high, you know, he's so high strong and he has a little bit of anxiety, you know, and the way he solves it is he barks and growls at people. You know, he's not bred to do that. We don't even know what he's bred for, you know? And that's, the, that's where I'm going for. It's like, what's in my dog? If you have a mix 
kind of looks like a German Shepherd is luckily there's genetic tests that we can do that at least is going to give us the mix of the breed. So if you have a mix or something that looks like a lab but acts a little bit weird, well, maybe do a test. And then a DNA test can say, well, you have 70% lab, 20% American Stafford Terrier, and 4% Chihuahua, yeah? and then 7% Australian Cattle Dog. Phenotypically, it's the perfect black lab. Genetically, genotypically, you have a problem. Yeah? So doing that, and there's um, the company that I love is Embark. If you ever like um, genetic testing, it's cheap. They also do um, um, hereditary uh, diseases. Um, Genetically, it will say, hey, your dog's going to die from cancer and all that stuff in like 17 years. They, they have tests like that, and it's pretty accurate. They have allergy tests. I love the company. Embark's pretty cheap. You can buy it online. And I think there's even a link on my website uh, to them. I'm not sponsored by them. I just love them, and then I promote them. But it's really worthwhile to, to look at... Um, you know, if, if you don't know where a dog comes from, you have it from a shelter, is do a little bit of research. And then when we do research, what is the things that we need to look for? It's what do I have? Well, I'm going to have a list of dogs, breeds, and what do I need to, to do research now? How do I know what dog I have? So I have, you know, Black Lab. I have Stafford Terrier, I have Chihuahua, I have, you know, so let's say Australian Cattle Dog. Let's do the mix. That's what I have. And so say if this 70%, 10, 10, 10 to make it easy. What's going to happen? The likelihood that the dog has some innate behaviors of all these dogs is pretty high. So what do I need to study? What? Yeah, what is the mix? Oh, my, my, my black lab barks more than my friend's black lab. One, two, three barkers. Oh, that's maybe why. My black labs love to dig. Oh, one, two, three diggers. You see what I'm saying? And so by understanding that and not immediately, oh, I have a black lab, so I'm going to treat him like a black lab. Um, but understanding what other innate behaviors I have, I can now alter my training. Does that make sense? And I can now better understand why he does these behaviors so I don't need to turn into a dick all the time. Because if I think, hey, I have 100% black lab, and what I read about the black lab is, is that they're from Canada, that they're fishers, that they're pullers, that they're retrievers, but I've never really read about anything about barking and digging and, and doing all that kind of stuff, that now you understand. Does that make sense? And if, you're, if your little black lab doesn't retrieve that well, and you're interested in fly ball, that this guy is probably not the best choice to go into fly ball competitions. He might retrieve, but he's not going to be a champion. Why? Because these are all the other things in, in there. He's, he's going to do different things with a ball than... Is it trainable? Yes. But in training, will I run into issues? Probably. And what is she going to, to be that? They're very predictable. I probably have a dog that's going to bark. I probably have a dog that's going to chase stuff. I probably have a dog that's going to dig, dig, in, dig in stuff and look for stuff. So if I know that before I have it, if I know that, what can I do? I can start preventing it by early training. Does that make sense? I can now, when I have this young dog, I got this litter of puppies, and this is what came out of the puppy. Now I can start in the imprinting phase doing, doing different stuff. 
Yeah, I can from the get go st stop letting him exhibit some of that innate behavior. Yeah, does that make sense? I can start letting him do different stuff. Any questions? Any questions online? I'll give a one minute pause. Are there any questions rolling in there, Ariel? So what else is important if we, if we know our dogs, if we understand what we have, why is that important? Why is it important to know the dog that we have? Why is that important? You can have reasonable expectations. Sure. Mary said that we can manage expectations. But the most important um, aspect for me is that we can manage his environment. I am a rat breeder. I love rats. And my dream dog is a Chihuahua Terrier mix. Would that be a good environment for the dog to learn how to become? Probably not. Yeah? I have a black lab and I live on a lake and I love fishing. Would that be a good idea? Yes. Why? Because you can probably let the dog do his job. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah. But, but you see where I'm, where I'm getting uh, at? So by managing the environment, I can either increase genetic triggers or I can decrease genetic triggers. Yeah. If I have a very anxious dog, and um, I'm looking at AL here because they made the biggest sacrifice that I've ever seen any dog owner do, is um, their dog Bella um, was um, chronically overstimulated and got um, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, chronic, chronic stress syndrome by that overstimulation because they lived downtown San Francisco with fireworks that would go off every day with, you know, all the traffic, all the chaos and the dog, um, you know, was overstimulated. The way they managed the environment is they said, we're going to sell our house and move to Washington state and now we're in the, the country somewhere in Tenino and all those stimulations are gone. And what happened to the dog? Oh, calm, calm down. Yeah, and you know why? Because all these innate triggers, all the innate responses are now managed because we manage the environment. So I have a dog that um, is a little bit people nervy, people reactive. Yeah, but you're also the, the house on the block that likes to throw the parties and the barbecues and be socially very and, uh, active. Uh, probably not a good idea then. It's probably not the right environment to manage your dog in. Yeah? So if you have a dog that, um, you know, like, like to chase uh, wildlife and all that stuff, and then you live in the country on a farmland, and the, the, the exercise that you give your dog is open the, open the back door and give him free room to the pastures, what do you think is going to happen? Your neighbor's chickens are toast, Mary said. Yeah, indeed. So we are, we are going to reinforce often the behavior that naturally occurs because we open the door, there's a pasture, there's a, a raccoon, there's a rabbit, there's a squirrel, and we don't have control because it's too cold outside in Washington. It's raining, but we have the, we have the room, so we open the door. The dog can have free access to the yard, and now what, he's do, what, what is he doing? He's self-reinforcing the behaviors you don't want. Because he says, hey, I smell something. Can you, can you imagine letting Tiny out just in a yard, in a, in a pasture? Like, <laughs> it's going to be dug up in no time. Yeah? 
If you have a, 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 a dog that likes to chase Bella, for instance, if you would put her in a pasture and she is obsessed by chasing squirrels, rabbits, and all that stuff, what's going to happen? That's what she's going to do. And if you're like in front of your fireplace, um, because um, you don't have the time to take care of your dog to manage the environment, what are you doing? You're reinforcing all the stuff that you don't want. Yeah. So if you have a dog that uh, pulls a lot and you hate pulling, but innately that's what he does, and then there's, there's other factors, but from a puppy, the first thing that you do is you live in the city and you want to take him around the block all the time, what do you think is going to happen? You reinforce pulling. And you're going to punish that, and what, what are you doing? Creating frustration. Yeah? So by managing the environment, we can manage the dog that we have, and this is the first thing that we need to do. If we want to change the behaviors that we find that are um, annoying for us, but that are innately in the dog, the first thing that we need to do is forget what we want and manage what we have, and that starts by managing the environment. Yeah? If I have a dog that is uh, a little bit dog sensitive, he's dog attractive even. Yeah, it doesn't mean to be dog reactive, but when he sees a dog, the first thing that he wants to do is go, go look at it, go play. Probably take him, out, take him out in the city and walk him around the dog park might not be the smartest thing to do. Why? Because the dog innately is very dog um, uh, attractive and the, the only thing that's going to happen is as I'm going to correct it. So what, what would be a better choice? To manage the environment and make him attractive to something different. That, has, that gives him the same motivation. And that takes time. Does that make sense? Yeah, so rather than punishing for something that he innately does, I'm going to um, prevent him from having that exposure and build another motivator. And then slowly but surely, with that, with that new motivator, bring the dog back and show him that the new motivator is actually more fun than the old motivator. And that's how you would do it, especially with innate uh, uh, behaviors. When your dog's a dick, for instance, yeah, and he doesn't have normal reactivity and he doesn't hold that stuff, but now he just makes a stupid mistake because he gives you the finger, then a correction is absolutely in place. Yeah, and I always say, um, so I'm not against any punishment or aversives, I use that all the time. However, if you give an aversive, your dog should have expected the punishment. If your dog did, did not expect the punishment, that punishment is not in place. Yeah, because dogs, when they're in a pack, they expect being bitten if they do something stupid with another pack member. Yeah? So when there's innate drivers um, at play and your dog follows that innate drivers, he follows his instinct, punishment is not something that he expects. Does that make sense? So that's where we need to do that a little bit uh, differently. Yeah? What else do we think uh, we need to manage? The motivators, eh? That's also very important. If I have a dog that is obsessed by chasing, and I, I would constantly reinforce, and this is how the Malinois became a horrible breed right now. Eh? I think 80% of the Malinois bred in, in today, and this is on record, um, are obso absolutely um, not Malinois, uh, there's got nothing to do with the Malinois. Because uh, when I grew up, the Malinois was this very confident, um, um, well-balanced dog that had great drives, um, was naturally very protective but wasn't over the top. It wasn't like the crazy French ring melon was that you see that when you see a ball, it's like, bah, 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 bah. It wasn't like that. Yeah, they were, they were drivey dogs, but they were very calm. They had a good balance. They had a good on and off switch. They were very loyal to the family, to the owner. And now most melon was are loyal to anything that moves and anything that, that, that you have uh, in your hands. Um, and I see that here all the time. The Malinois that I, that I see here are over-driven. They're, they're locked in prey and they, they don't have balance. And the reason why is because 
due to sports is we reinforced a lot of these motivators. It's chase, 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 ball, 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 and eventually the dog gets locked into that one thing and we can't do anything about this anymore. So managing motivators is extremely important that we do not get dogs that are too obsessed by uh, a thing and that we do not get dogs that are um, yeah, that are that are not able to do anything else but that one thing. Yeah. Um, so preventing the dogs, I, and and you see that with prey dogs a lot. With um, um, you know, e even in, in in the German Shepherd, I see these prey locked dogs that as soon as the prey drive kicks in, they're locked into it, and it's gen genetically, and you can't you can't do anything. Um, with these dogs anymore. They scream, they bark, they chase. They're, um, so managing motivators um, is, is a really, really big, uh, you know, big uh, aspect. So if I manage motivators, if I manage the environment, what else do I need to do? Provide the work that the dog innately does. Yeah? So the utility let the dog uh, utility let the dog do his job and that is really important so when when people see dogs you know for instance like darko or they see some of my dogs or they say some of the um you know, the, 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 the good working dogs, the, the, the trackers like Shiru, the, the, the trackers, and then people inspire to have dogs like this. Yeah? And they say, oh my God, I want my dog to do this. This is great. The reason why many of these dogs are good is because the dogs were actually bred to do the job, and the owner and the dog are doing the job. And the owner and the dog have managed the environment where the, jo the, the job is done in. And also the, the owner and the dog has managed each other's motivators from puppyhood. And the reason why so many people fail is because they start their dogs off as puppies completely wrong. So when you have a dog that has, is bred to work, that, for instance, your lab, and as a puppy, what did you do? You took him to AKC class, you took him on the couch, he's so cutie, cutie, cute. Um, you, you made him do things that he didn't do naturally, you didn't manage his environment, and you, and, and, and cetera, and cetera. And the dog is seven, eight, nine months old, and now becomes this very frustrated little thing, and all these innate behaviors certain, suddenly explode. Yeah? The reason why, you know, when, when we see these so-called well-trained dogs is because what we have managed as a puppy is the environment based upon all the, the antecedents and the predispositions that influenced what the dog was, is going to become. Yeah? So if I have, for, for instance, I have Walkira here, which is 50% German Shepherd, 25% Wolf and 25% Coyote. You think I, I trained her the same as little guy? You think I trained little guy the same as Riker? Hell no. Because I have two different dogs. Like, like I have a Czech dog and I have an East German dog. Like those are two, two completely different, different style dogs. The engagement is the same, but the way I manage the environment and the way I manage the motivators and the, the way the job that the dog does is completely different. And that is what people, um, where people make a mistake when they get a new puppy or they get a new dog, um, is that from puppyhood, and if you, um, I'm going to talk about the imprinting period here, is that if we, if we do the opposite things we should have done in the imprinting phase, we actually reinforced a lot of the problem behaviors. And now these problem behaviors are imprinted. So when the dog now becomes an adolescent and after sexual, uh, uh, the sexual ranking uh, period, all these problem behaviors will rise to the surface again. 
And the problem with these problem behaviors is because they are also associated to you, they're conditioned to you. So now we have a huge problem getting rid of those. It's because we didn't understand what dog we have. And we only bandaged some of the behaviors by intimidation and by putting aversives on the dog. And now when the dog grows up and eventually back, the dog now is three, four years old, he becomes mature and our problem behaviors are, are uh, magnified because we didn't know what we have. And that is where I would you know, advise every, every new dog owner or any, every dog owner that thinks about buying another dog or buying a new dog is really, really do research is what do you want? And then get the dog that can fulfill that list. Yeah, if you want to have a calm dog, if you want to have the hiking buddy, if you want to have um, a dog that, um, that lives on an apartment, then um, you know, maybe, maybe a Malinois is not the right, the right dog for you. Yeah, maybe um, the Irish wolf dog is the better dog because that's a giant, a calm, calm giant that you can have in a studio apartment even though he's 200 pounds and he doesn't need as much room and energy as Bandit uh, needs because there's Australian Shepherd in that, that guy, there's German Shepherd in that guy, there's God knows whatever else in that guy. Um, and he probably, the, the, the Irish Wolfhound does not need as much uh, space and energy as Goose does. So if you want to have the calm dog in the city, well, the big giant might be, or a Great Dane, for instance, might be your better choice. Or a Mastiff. Yeah, Mastiff mixes don't need a lot of room and stuff to roam because they're very genetically calm dogs. Um, so talking about the... Um, Talking about that, one of the first things that we, we need to do is when, when we have this dream picture is study the breeds and not the looks. Is forget the phenotype and go to the genotype. Yeah, study the, the breed that will fill in what you want to do with the dog and not what the dog looks like. And the, the reason why we have so many problems with dogs is that people buy dogs because of looks and not because of their personality. Not, they're not matched to their lifestyle. They're not matched to their uh, home environment. They buy the dogs because it looks cute. So one of the things that um, most of my um, my clients that buy dogs from me, they call me the ultimate canine matchmaker. And I never let my clients pick out their own dog. I don't do it. Um, I don't care what you like. I don't care what you... I will give you the right dog for your personality, for your lifestyle. And that is what I what I do all the time with my, 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 dog, my, my people say, hey, I want a protection dog and I want a Malinois and I want a blah, 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 and I want this size and I want that size and whatever it is. And I say, yeah, I don't give a shit. This is what you are. This is the person who you are. This is where you live. This is what the dog's job is going to be. This is your social circle. This, are, this is your, your job and your dog needs to fit into that job. This is the dog that I... Oh, it's got long hair. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And then eventually when the dogs go to these owners, they all said the same thing. This is the best dog I've ever owned in my entire life. I had never had any problems with that dog. And then when these dogs travel, and then they meet other people, everybody said, oh my God, I want a dog like this. Well, probably not that one because your personality does not match this dog. And that is where I'm going to, is in order for us to understand what we want, we need to know what we have. If we want a dog, of our dreams, we need to know 
what human we have. If we don't know that, we don't know what dog we want. Because this is going to influence and a lot of what the outcome is of that. And so there's my other thing. So if I know what kind of person I am, what environment I live in, what I like to do in life, and then I'm going to look for a dog, I can do that. I can look for the, the perfect dog. However, if I now have the dog, now I need to know what human do I need to become. What human do I need to be in order to be successful with the dog? And that is where I'm always saying in behavior modification is in order to change the behavior of the dog, I need to start with a human. If I don't change my behavior, I will not be successful. And where people get into trouble is when they have when they have a dog that is as challenged, like May has a challenging dog, uh, you have a challenging dog. In, in, in your world, for you, Goose is a very challenge. Everybody has challenges with the dog. And the reason why is we didn't, we didn't buy the dog for what we wanted. We just ended up with a dog that we, that we have, is that Part of the success, or 80% of the success, is for us to change. For us to change the perception, is for us to change and let go of our goals, and start behaving in a way that the dog that we have understands, and that the dog that we have can change. Yeah, if I have a dog that is dog reactive, but I like dog parks, how could I change myself? Not go to dog parks. Super simple. But I love going to dog parks. I'll go to dog parks without the dog, and then socialize, grab a cup of tea, you know, give cookies to everybody, but leave the dog at home. And then your motivators are fulfilled because you like going to dog parks, but leave the freaking dog alone. Yeah? If you, you like to go on a hike, but your dog pulls you like crazy, don't take the dog for a hike. Go to rentadog.com and find the dog that does like to go on a hike. That, that actually exists, rentadog.com. Um, but you see, it's to slowly but surely like change, change what you are going to do in order to facilitate the dog that you have. And then, um, well, you have a dog that likes pulling. Oh, you know what a good sport would be for Goose? Weight pulling. Better than agility. Why? Because he's genetically bred to pull. You see where I'm going? Is then, oh, but I wanted to do, I wanted to do dog sports. I wanted to do agility. Well, your dog's not built for an agility dog. You're built, your dog's built like a brick and likes to pull. So if we change what we are going to do with the dog and then start doing the job that the dog is bred to do, what is going to happen, you think, with the relationship and with the dog? So much more oh, so much more happy. Why? Because he's more calm. Why? Because he's fulfilled. That's why sometimes I tell people, you know, like me, when they come here with a dog that is bred to do shutsund, it's a, one of the things that people are afraid of is, that, is bite work. And then what I tell people is that you should let your dog bite. Like, let him bite a lot. Why? I said, it's going to calm him down. Really? And then people don't understand that. Because if you let the dog do the job that he's bred to do, he's going to be calm. Yeah? Same thing with, um, with Bandit. He's an Australian uh, shepherd. What did he like to do? Herd. Herd, run around stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably if he start doing that, he's going to start loving it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um... Any questions? Any questions online?
you know? Okay. So what I hope is that with this, uh, this lecture here is that um, I, I have inspired you a little bit to do a little bit more research in what dog do you have and how do you live and to think about who you are as a human. And the, the reason why I, I, I do these lectures is to motivate people to have a deeper look at themselves to have a deeper look in their own social and living environment um, and to study the dog. And then slowly but surely, not just make training adjustments with the collar or with type of food you have, but start making training adjustments by adjusting you know, your goals, your environment, um, your motivators, etc., etc. And slowly but surely together come closer, both you and the dog. And, even and eventually, what happens is you'll come to a middle ground. If you always dreamt of a dog sport and doing agility, well, now you end up maybe with a dog sport, but it's dog pulling. Or you ended up in a bite sport, or you ended up in search and rescue, or, you know, whatever it is. You know, you bought this Schutzen dog, but the, the dog really doesn't do like bite work, but he likes using his nose, so in doing search and now you went into search and rescue. Big deal your dog will be, tr be thriving. But I, I, I wrote, wrote this on my website. For me, forcing a dog in a job that he innately doesn't want to do for me is animal cruelty. And the reason why I say this is I would not want it to be forced in a job that I don't want to do. And I have never have in my entire life. I've never done a job that I didn't want to do. Because what happens if people do a job that they don't like or they don't want to do? How do they feel? Angry. Miserable, angry, stressed, frustrated. And if you do a job that never felt like a job, what are people doing? They're happy. If they don't do the job because of the paycheck, but actually be, they do the job because of what it does to them, because of the feeling that it gives them, what does it do to the people? They're less stressed. And so with dogs, that's the same thing. So we need to have a look at, look at that. We need to get closer together. Yeah, and it's going to change the way you train and it's going to solve a lot of your issues with the dog. Because if we do that um, kind of analysis and then we, we, are, we, are, we are managing that environment, we are managing the motivators and we truly understand much better where the dogs come from and what triggers some of these problem behaviors, our patience will increase. And the reason why a lot of people um, fail in their dog training is because of lack of patience. Sometimes they say, oh, I'll give it another couple months. You know, just, just, just wait, wait and you will see. Yeah, make that little change there. Oh, really? I need to get up at 5.45 instead of 6, yeah, and then see what changes. And then eventually, um, when the time comes for to get another dog or a, or a second dog, or um, by, by understanding this lecture, you'll be much better equipped to find the right dog for you rather than you know, going on looks and going on like, oh, my friend's got a lab, so I need a lab. And, and so on, and so on. Good. Ken, any questions? And uh, share what you uh, wanted for the. Can you uh, fool me, uh, Al? I thought of one example when you were talking about um, the environment. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you remember this gentleman and his children, and the dog would bite the children, and they mm -hmm. could never come downstairs. And mm -hmm. um, you gave him examples and things to do, and his whole demeanor and the dog's demeanor, everything changed. Yes. So they came back and it was just a different dog. It was, eh? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a good, I forgot about that client, but yeah. yeah. He's a nice guy and so was his kids. Mm -hmm. And his kids really became one with the dog also because- With the Frenchie. Yes. Yeah, I still have contact with Henry. <laughs> yeah, I can't yeah. remember his name. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is a good example. 
And that, that family literally threw everything overboard. And um, yeah, the, 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 the little kids that were afraid of the dog were the dog's best friend, and the dog that wanted to eat the kids were now the, the kid's best friend. It was a, it's a beautiful transformation that we've done. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. And then if uh, Henry's watching, this one's for you. Any questions, anything you, you learned from this lecture, anything you want to share? I learned a lot, and I did have one question back when you were talking about doing the uh, genetics test. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that, um, that I should do that even if my dog came from, like, AKC paper dogs? Yes. Okay. I have seen many AKC 100% um, German Shepherds where there was 25% German Shepherd in it. What? Mm -hmm. wow. It's not because it looks like a German Shepherd that it is a German Shepherd. Yeah, there's a big difference between phenotype and genotype. Cool. Yeah. And there's a lot of, un unfortunately, fake paperwork out there too. Mm -hmm. It's like I probably could give Goose Malinois papers if I find the right Romanian and give him enough money. Yeah. But, there's there's people out there. So yeah, genetic testing is is the only answer for me. Cool. Okay. Uh, May, any questions? Anything you you learned? Uh, things that stood out? It's more the steepness of my learning curve. I, I, I don't think I have any questions. So what what was what is it? What stood out for you today? Um, I think just how powerful the innate behaviors are. Yes. Yeah. I think that's key, is, is really understanding the innate behaviors and the strength of it mm -hmm. and what we need to do with it. Okay? Any questions? Anything you liked about the lecture? I love the lecture. It was great. I learned a lot, a lot, a lot of mm -hmm. things that I never thought about before getting banned, obviously. And um, just, uh, I'm going to do the genetic testing, I think, and it Good. gives me more information. Yes, know, very smart. Which we need a lot. And yeah, we don't know, we don't really know much about his history at all. I exactly. Mean, we're, taking, we're guessing. <laughs> so. It yes. would be great, very helpful to know and how and so in, we direct him. In exactly. Right way. And in your situation, and this is part of what we're doing in the training too, because mm -hmm. often when we don't know the history, mm -hmm. one of the things that we do in training is literally ask, ask the dog questions. Mm -hmm. And the way we ask the dog questions is by certain interactions. We put him in a, in a, in a certain situation, we see how he, he acts. Mm -hmm. You know, we put him in a different situation, we see how he acts. Mm -hmm. And that way we can... Um, we get a lot of information from the dog's behavior and if we see consistencies in responses even in different situations one could almost conclude that some of that is uh, innately triggered mm -hmm. um, we don't know that 100 percent but we can come to a, a pretty certainty and that is you know that is what i try to do in behavior modification if we don't really know the uh, antecedents of the dog and we we you know, it's, I wouldn't say a blank slate, but it's a gray slate, mm -hmm. is, is with exercises and with, um, with putting them in, in different situations, mm -hmm. is go from 50,000 shades of gray to eventually black and white. And once we have made that analysis of, okay, this is what triggers uh, him in situation A, B, C, this is the intensity levels, now we can come up with a plan in order to change him and fix him. Yeah? And that's why behavior modification often takes a while because we have that like question and answer game with the dog because you know the dog can't tell us like, hey, this, this, this is where I come from and this is all the, the problems uh, that I have. Yeah, good. Uh, Charlie, any questions? Anything you wanna share? No, I'm good. I've just been through my own journey with both my dogs. Um, you know, I mean, Khaleesi, you know, she's genetically a show dog. Mm -hmm. And initially it was going to be bite work and we had to adjust the training path on that and found something that she enjoyed doing and she succeeded and thrived in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, uh, <clears throat> with Kaiser, knowing what we had and I had to change how I was with him. Yeah. And now, and I think I think that about. your, your situation there is, is a good example. Uh, you have changed. Mm -hmm. to help the dog right because the i i think 90 percent of the success factor between kaiser and you was you yeah. is that the way you saw the dog and the way you interacted with the dog and the way you managed his environment that has absolutely uh, led to the success that um that you're in now and and 
the, the ability that you created for the dog to expose him to training that, you know, two years ago wasn't even possible. Yeah. And that's, that is because the way you changed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, those, those two different ones, you know, I have two completely different dogs, different approach. I changed and. And the way you act with these dogs is also different. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, you know, I'm happier and they're happier. So exactly. It's a, it's a win-win. Good. <laughs> Mary, any questions? Anything you want to share? Um, just that, uh, like anybody who knows, Tiny, Tiny and I got stuck with each other. Um, I did not look for Tiny. Um, and when Tiny and I came here, like I hated the dog. I absolutely hated the dog. Um, but he was unadoptable, so I was stuck with him. And just sticking with it, like I have a great dog, and I had to change. But that meant that our relationship got better and then he actually started participating in training which with a terrier chihuahua is kind of an accomplishment and i mean i wouldn't give the dog up now for a million dollars so even if you like are hating your dog right now like there is light at the end of the tunnel um and i think it's hard to realize when you're just frustrated with oh my god this dog is driving me crazy mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the journey between you and Tyne have been remarkable because it's also very similar like uh, like Charlie. I think you as a person has changed a lot to accommodate the dog and th therefore the dog has changed and now you're on a path, um, you know, where you're both, you know, comfortable with each other and um, has this mutual respect and, and fun. Um, and I think that's, uh, yeah, that, that's been great. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, looking at the group here to see if there's any questions um, in the online. I don't know if you see any questions there, uh, Charlie or Mike. No, I'm not seeing anything. No. I have one more question. Okay. Uh, can you define antecedents? Okay, so what are antecedents? That is a good, uh, good question. So antecedents is everything that comes prior to a moment. So for instance, um, your dog walks into the, the living room or here in the garage and we ask the dog to sit and then the dog has a behavioral response of sitting. The stimuli sit is an antecedent of the response of sitting and everything that happened before are antecedents. The people that walked, walked in here, the, the urine that he smelled, um, the door that opened, the dog that maybe barked before all that sitting behavior, everything that happened prior to a moment is what we call antecedents. Other, other things that are antecedents are genetic makeup or the years of domestication. So antecedents can be very short. Yeah, so the antecedent of me riding to the tick is I was standing here and people were talking. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And but also, um, like I said, one of my antecedents is become I come, I come from a generation of assholes. Yeah, I, that's how I opened, you know, 250 years of assholeness in my family, those are antecedents. So antecedents go far back and antecedents in training is um, sit was an antecedent of the response of sitting. So if I say sit, the dog sat, that was an antecedent of that behavior of sitting. And then if I would do a visual before my audible, which you should never do, then that was an antecedent of that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically antecedents, you see that the, the entire history prior to an event. Thank you. Yeah? A question here online uh, from Taylor. Dr. Bart, how can we determine what type of a dog we have through training, i.e. search and rescue, protection, working, et cetera? So, um, so how can we determine what dog that we have for protection, et cetera? Um, that is for me all genetic, uh, knowing what lines the dog comes from, especially for the German Shepherds. Um, and then, um, like with, uh, like with bandits, um, if we don't know anything, 
uh, of the dog it's the question and answer game um, with the dog is uh, giving the dog particular exercises and through different exercises and behavioral um, responses of the dog in the exercises that we get answers in what the dog is actually is so if I put the dog um, in a room and I put uh, for instance I have Darko and I take Darko and I put a swimming pool full of noodles and and plastic bottles and the dog comes in and he runs through all the bottles and and stuff flies everywhere it's it's noisy and the dog is confident and still does his job you probably know that hey this dog has, has is environmentally sound and I probably have a, a better chance in exposing him to more challenging environments where if I have a dog that's like he comes in and he oh my god he's skittish I probably have a good answer that there's some antecedents that might lead to um, a conclusion that he has some genetic anxiety etc etc so by by, by doing these trial and errors and having these exposures, my dog will give me the right answer. And that is basically what I do in my, in my training uh, with you guys. Any other questions? Thank you for the compliments, guys. And this exposition of the power of the breed and history and uh, inherent traits, but also the importance of being aware of the difference between uh, phenotype and genotype um, is equally because there are Malinois that visually um, aesthetically look like males but have none of the traditional working abilities and characteristics. And lastly, focusing uh, forcing a dog to do something it doesn't want to do is simply for sake of one's own ego is abusive. Thank you, phenomenal lecture. Thank you, Brittany, um, for the compliment. Another one from uh, Billy. And then Billy. Billy says, I often see sports working dog people wash dogs from their programs. They usually offer a precursor to the rehoming washing. I know these lines and have worked with these exact genetics in various dogs. They reference that this particular litter for some reason is different. I'm guessing that this is uh, do the genotypic traits or do you think they are full of shit, uh, the latter, <laughs> and just want to wash the dog because they are running into behavioral uh, problems created by their training methods. Yes, uh, Billy, uh, that, is, that is often the latter. Um, many dog trainers will um, throw away dogs um, because they, they do not understand the inherent traits, they do not understand the genetic makeup. And um, um, I see so many uh, dog sports trainers that can train and that are actually very good at it that can train one particular dog they can train the ball drivey um, confident forward uh, dog but as soon as the dog shows any uh, lack of motivation to bite or and the motivation to bite could be um, influenced by um, you know inherent anxiety or some some other stuff that those trainers do not know um, how to fix it and and this is and this is the biggest thing the those behaviors are often created by their training methods uh, because uh, in the sport dog world uh, most trainers will go immediately to aversive so at a young age four five six months old there's the prong collar there's the e collar and they i would say by by negative reinforcement um, are, are trying to train the dog new skills and then often the dog fails or there's a lack of biting or they, they don't, they push the dog uh, too far. It's not because the puppy bites a rag that now I can 
have, uh, have the puppy by the rack with environmental stressors. Um, if the trainer is used to dogs that can do that, and then uh, they, they come across a dog that can't, they'll say, hey, this dog is not suitable for the sport and is actually an outcome from their lack of understanding of behavior and their lack of uh, uh, adaptability of their training methods. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I face any trainer um, and tell him he's full of shit. So, um, and that's, that's what I do and that's why I have, um, that's why so many trainers hate, hate my guts. Um, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud that in the sport dog world, um, many trainers hate my guts because uh, it's their inability to push the dog beyond. Um, I always say um, a good dog trainer is a dog trainer that, make, uh, that can make a bad dog good. And it's not that can make a good dog look better, you know. That is, that is for me great uh, training. The, the easiest thing is a drivey, confident dog that wants to work. The, the biggest problem is a dog that doesn't want to work and doesn't have the uh, environmental confidence to bring him to a level um, like Kaiser. You know, Kaiser was hiding in a corner and took me a one and a half, two years to even, to even get them interested. And then when you, know, when you would bring Kaiser now to a club, then everybody would say, yeah, wow, let's go ahead. You, you would have brought Kaiser uh, when he was, when you came to me, everybody would ditch him. And then it's the trainer that says, oh my God, look what, I, look what I can do with these dogs. And I see it all the time. Look at Rommel, when Rommel came here. Oh, yeah. yeah, he went to all the Schutzen trainers here and they all threw him out. And now, you know, Rommel's, uh, Rommel's uh, able to go to any Schutzen club and say, oh my God, like, yeah, let's, let's work this dog. It's because of they didn't understand. So yes, Billy, I think most of them are full of shit. However, there are exceptions um, in, the, in, the, in the sport dog world, and I see them um, luckily uh, more and more. Um, I see my, some friends in Belgium that are starting um, you know, to, to be creative and, and allow um, the lesser sport dogs to give them a chance. Okay, Ayal, you have questions or things you want to say? You know, just uh, personality-wise also plays a uh, part. Bella was very... I mean, I, I could tell that she's a working line from day one, but she was the one showing us what she likes. So, for example, if she wants to do prey, that's okay. But she actually kind of showing us that she wants us to be there as well. So when I play with her with leaves, it's not just like I'm letting her chase a squirrel mm -hmm. so the level of enjoyment that i see from her when i'm kind of participating is beyond yeah, exactly mm -hmm. and that is important and that is changing the motivator so you know um you still fulfill the motivation to change but you also interact within the game and now instead of chasing the squirrel she chases you and the the the, the leaves and you add the value to the chasing game and that becomes reinforcing and that 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 redirects the attention from something you don't like chasing animals to something you like is playing um, your leaf chasing game together yeah and i think this is a, a good uh, time to end with that one um, for the people online thank you very much for uh, watching um, the unfortunately facebook has a bug um, with the time change everything changed to 11 o'clock for some people um, Remember, all the lectures always are at 10 o'clock. Yeah, there will never be a lecture that starts at 11. Everything is always at 10 o'clock. Um, so um, I will double check the upcoming lectures time. But um, and um, I checked this morning and on my end, everything said 10 o'clock. Um, some people say, yeah, it's 10 with me and with others, it was 11. Um, so I think the time change has, uh, has threw a, a bug in there, but uh, for future references, all, all lectures will be at 10. Um, again, thank you for watching. Leave me any more comments and questions below. Um, I will get, uh, get to them and answer them, and I will see everybody in the next uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.